We're still recording, right? Oh, yeah. Call from Gillespie Randy. Call from Gillespie. Hello? Yeah? Michael is over here doing my life history. Yep, he's... Yep. <laughs> I know. Okay. Okay, bye. Tell me your name, the, um, your age, what year you were born, and where you were born. My name is Charlene Eck. Nelson. I was born to Denise and Bill Eck. And I was born in 1934 in Manistique, Michigan, right on Lake Michigan, practically. I was born at home. wasn't in the hospital. They didn't even have a hospital in that town. Can you tell us what it was like growing up as a young child in Manistique, Michigan? Well, it was a small town. There was only 5,000 people in it. So there was not much to do. But um, um, well, my dad, his company was called Manistic Ice and Dre. So he used to move people. And uh, there was one family that had five kids and they had no money. So I went around collecting clothes and food for them. And that's sort of what I did. I, I didn't have a very exciting life compared to the other kids, you know. I remember my grandpa, his dad, had a big uh, garden and he grew uh, carrots and radishes and I used to take a wagon, fill up a wagon and go up and down the street trying to sell this stuff. From the garden? Yeah. How old were you? Probably five. <laughs> you try to sell garden vegetables? I was trying to make money. <laughs> so you were a hustler from the beginning? I guess because I, you know, I didn't do anything that kids my age did. They all, you know, went to football games and I didn't do that. Why not? Because I, I was too busy working. Why did you think you needed to work so hard? I don't know. I think I needed to help my mother. And I know the first thing I ever bought her was a wristwatch when I got my job at the bank. What kind of watch was it? I don't know, an Elgin. Did she like it? Yeah, she liked it. She, she was proud of you and impressed that you were able to buy her a watch at such a young age? <laughs> I don't know if she appreciated me or not. <laughs> no, really? I think she did. My mother took me to Green Bay, which was 150 miles from Manistique to buy clothes for school. And I had an, enough clothes that I could wear something different every day for 30 days. When I was probably 15, my mother and dad went to Detroit and left me home alone with Marsha and um, Punky and David, and David was just a baby. And I would have to pick up the mail from the post office and take it to the train, and then from the train back to the post office. And that was a lot of responsibility for somebody 16 years old. I think I was in high school when we did that. My dad was a distributor, a beer distributor, and a soda pop, so he made me this big we lived on a corner lot, and he made me this big tent with a wood floor and kept it supplied with stuff to sell. And so I made money that way. And then I wanted to go get a job as a waitress, and there was a restaurant on Lake Michigan that was hiring people, and so I said I was going to go get me a job. He says, oh, no, you won't get one because you're too bashful. You won't want to go ask for a job. Well, I got the job. And then um, he bought a brand new red pickup truck. And my cousin and I put Simon Eyes on the whole thing the day the truck came home. What Simon Eyes? 
Simon Ice. So it baked on. What, what is that? It's wax for a vehicle. Okay. But it, we couldn't get it off because it was baked on. So we ruined his nice red truck. So then he said, I said, now you told me you'd teach me how to drive. He says, oh, just take the truck and go. So I did. And he come running after me. But I, I think I was uh, in the eighth grade, and I was um, taking the truck to school. And when I was a freshman in, in high school, I took a truck or a car to school every day, and the parents called my dad up and said he's got to take that away from me because all their kids wanted to drive, wanted to take a car to school. But apparently he had something on one of the of the chief of police, and so they didn't do anything about me driving. He was he was only 40 years old when he died. How did he die? He thrombosis. He he and he woke one morning. He woke me up to go to school, and he said, "Don't go in the dining room." And he had coughed up blood all over the dining room table, and. So they put him in the hospital and packed his nose, and it, it, the packing came out, and he just, they had to take him to another town, and he died. He died when I was 17 years old. And so my mother and I, before I went to school in the morning, would deliver ice to the taverns and the restaurants, because at that time, they didn't have refrigerators like they do now. And he had two big ice houses, and so and filled them both up with ice in the winter time, and then you know he'd do a layer of of uh, ice and then put sawdust on top of it, and filled up two big ice houses, and he delivered ice to to uh, people's houses. They'd either call up and say they wanted ice, or they had a sign that they put in the window, and said that he. They were ready for their ice. How was your mother able to make money once your father died? She, uh, well, you know, they had their house paid for naturally. They paid cash for their house. I think it was $2,500. And she just, she worked as, uh, she worked as a waitress at the Arrowhead Inn, which we'll get back to that later because I worked there too. And she also worked at the first little restaurant that I worked at, that the one that my dad told me I couldn't get a job because I was too bashful. She worked there too. But she didn't really need to work that much. Oh, she worked at um, Brown's, which was a place that made brooms. She worked there too. She made brooms? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your family had a lot of odd jobs. <laughs> they did. <laughs> You want to know how I met him? We'd love to know. I drove up and down Main Street from one one street to the next, and I back and forth, and that's how I met him. Well, at the time, I was I had a boyfriend that was in the army, and one that was in the um, Air Force, and then I got Grandpa. So I had three of them going at the same time. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, where did you first see Gramps? Driving up and down the street. Were you driving down that street to find a boy? or? Were no, you just... that's because that's all we had to do. There was nothing, nothing else to do. Oh, that so your, that's what, and he, yeah, and that's what, and that's what he was doing. So he had just gotten out of the army. I think I tooted at him first. At least he says I did. I don't remember, but I think he's probably right. Well, we stopped, we stopped, I guess, on one of the streets, and he asked me out. He had a Chevy. <laughs> Chevy what? Just, just a four-door Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> I think my car was, I, at the time, I, at the time, my mother had bought a Plymouth, and that's what I had. And one, and the, he had a girlfriend who he was engaged to marry. And her dad worked for my dad, so we knew him really well. But at the time, 
you know, she, they weren't together when I, when I met Grandpa. Because when we got married and got our wedding picture back, her picture was in, her wedding picture was in the frame. And the, we figured the photographer just did that to be mean. He never, ever took me out to eat, never went to a movie. All we did was ride around. I don't know how come I put up with that, you know. I told you I had three boyfriends, you know, at one time. And um, he, Grandpa bought, bought me some rings and gave them to He just gave me the rings and said, when you're ready to be engaged, just put them on. So I put them on one day just to see how they looked, not that I wanted to be engaged. But that day, my boyfriend, the one that was in the Air Force, came home and I didn't know he was coming home. And so I went outside to meet him and he saw the rings on my finger. So he, that was the end of him. That was it? Just dumped you? Like yep, that? just dumped me. And he was, luckily, this is not very nice, but he would die. He had Alzheimer's when he died. And his wife is married to one of Grandpa Ott's sons. So you had the Air Force boyfriend, but then you had another boyfriend too. What he he was in the Army. He died of cancer. So I really lucked out because Grandpa lived a lot longer than they did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little morbid. <laughs> well, it's the truth. Yeah. Well, why did you choose Grandpa over the other Army guy? Oh, because because Grandpa was there, he was available. <laughs> I can't really say that I was madly in love with him, you know. <laughs> so just practical, right? <laughs> Convenient. <laughs> yeah, and he was good looking, um, and he was a good guy. He was funny. Did he make you laugh? He thought he was funny. Well, and Grandpa was Baptist, and I was Catholic, so at the time. If, you, if a Catholic married somebody other than a Catholic, they had to promise to raise the kids Catholic. And they had to take um, lessons in catechism. And Grandpa just told the priest, he says, I'll do whatever I'm supposed to do, just don't make me go through this. And so they didn't. But our church that we were going to get married in burnt down. So we had to get married in the basement of the school. And we had, we only had um, four attendants, two girls and two boys. But that that day, my mother made dinner for everybody for the wedding party, because it, it was November 28th, so it was around Thanksgiving. So she made a turkey dinner for everybody for the wedding party. And then that night had a reception for 300 people in her house. Grandpa's um, parents, because they were very strict Baptists, they weren't going to come to our wedding because they didn't want anything to do with me because I was Catholic. And so um, they wouldn't even give us a list of, luckily Grandpa knew most of their, their relatives and friends, and so we, got, we sent out invitations to them. But they didn't like me until I learned how to cook. And once I learned how to cook and had them over for dinner, then they thought I was okay. If we would have waited to get married and went till the new church was built, they were going to buy all our flowers for us, and it wouldn't have cost us a penny. Grandpa didn't want to wait. He wanted to marry you right away. And so that after, for the reception, the manager of the bank that I worked at, he said, if you people can get to Green Bay, Wisconsin, Tonight, I'll get you the bridal suite. And that's 150 miles away. But, you know, we were at the house until about 10 o'clock, and then we drove to that. We did make it to that town. And it was, um, he woke up in the morning, and I was all dressed up, had a hat on, was ready to go to church. <laughs> he went to uh, be a policeman, so he had to go to, from Manistique to I think Lansing, Michigan, and he had to had these 
agility tests. And there were five guys from Manistique that went there at the same time he did. He was the only one that passed. So he was going to be a state police. They gave him his gun, and he called me up to tell me that he passed. And I started crying. So he came home, quit and came home. Why did you start crying? Because I wanted him home. I had Billy, and I was pregnant for Tootsie, I think. And um, I just didn't want him to be gone. And so he quit and came home. Oh, he was in the Coast Guard. He was in the Army. As he was only in the Army for two years. Why not? Because he, I don't think he got drafted. I think he volunteered. Because that's all he wanted was two years. And to make money while he was in the Army, he used to sew clothes for the guys. He'd make their shirts smaller. He taught your mother how to make doll clothes. Really? So he was the sewer? Yep. He was, he was everything. Like he used, to, he took her out in the sidewalk and he cut out these little dresses for her doll. And, and he, he and your mother did that cornice on this for my drapes. He would, you know, when he was, a, and Hap was a twin, you know. His mother had twin girls. First she had Roy, then she had twin girls, and she had twin boys. And so the best of the twins got farmed out to somebody else because she was washing diapers by hand. She didn't have a washing machine. And um, of each set of twins, one was crabby and one was happy. So that's how Hap got his name. Hap was farmed out to somebody else. And one of the girls was farmed out to someone else. So what do you mean by farmed out? Well, the, the parents didn't take them. They c let somebody else take care of them. So Grandpa was adopted? No, he wasn't adopted, but he lived with somebody else. But he still knew his parents? Yeah. Then, well, they all lived on the same street. It's just that his mother couldn't take care of five kids. Yeah, Grandpa used to drive with two feet. And he had this little black Volkswagen. And he had back problems for a long time. And his back would go out on him. And I was working at Westgate at the bank. And I'd come home to see how he was doing at lunchtime. And he was laying on the floor because it was more comfortable for him, I guess. And I, so I gave him a shot of whiskey and something else. And that put him to sleep till I got home. And I thought, huh, oh, that's good. It's an easy way to get, you know, to make him feel better. So every day I'd give him a shot of whiskey and <laughs> he'd lay on the floor until I got home from work. <laughs> I didn't know he had a back problem. Oh, yeah. He w Once we had to call the ambulance to take him to the hospital, it was so bad. Well, it was much better than it was when he got older, Mike. He, he could he never, he got lost all the time. He he would get lost going to Santa Cruz. He he had no sense of direction at all. And the one time that we got divorced, I got actually got out of the car and went and stayed in a hotel. And he kept riding around the block, you know, looking for me. But <laughs> he didn't know where you were. He no, he didn't know where I was. I told him I says I'm getting on a bus and going home. He says okay. But Wasn't he, he worried? Well, yeah, he kept look, riding around looking for me, but he finally found me. But, oh, he had terrible eating habits. He never ate very much. That's why he was so skinny. But he'd make a sandwich, and he'd put a little bit of butter, butter and mustard in the middle of the bread and um, maybe a piece of bologna on it. And that's what he'd take to work for his lunch. He was not a good eater. I have to sing? Sing. <laughs> oh. You can sing, girl. I can't sing. You want to sing as a song? No, I can't sing. Why not? That's what Grandpa told me. I could never carry a tune. You should sing. Why not? That's why I don't even try singing, because he told me I couldn't sing. What, did you used to sing for him? I was in the glee club. No way. But he said they just gave me a job in the glee club because everybody else had one, and so they 
I think I was an alto or I, anyway, I couldn't sing. Do you have advice for your future grandkids <laughs> on how to raise how to raise their kids? Yeah. Well, that's hard, Mike, because every kid is different. Every kid is different. You know, look how different Tootsie and Debbie are. I had good kids for one thing, you know, then none of them got in trouble. Except Debbie, she hit one of her girlfriend's mother. She hit, actually hit her because I forget what she was mad about, but she hit her and then she came home and told Hap and he went over to talk to the lady and he said, oh, she deserved it. And Tootsie, she just got her driver's license the day before Christmas, I think. And she had an accident. She, I don't, I forget what she did, but anyway, it was with a truck. And so, to make her feel better, we gave her one of her Christmas presents, and it was a rabbit hair jacket. But she felt so bad, and it was her fault. But what about the big painting she painted in her bedroom? On the wall? That, yeah. that was good. It was a butterfly or something. Yeah, she, kind of she did a good. Yeah, well, yeah, she would. Well, she was. Debbie was more of a hippie than she was. Debbie used to. At that time, those kids, they really weren't wearing jeans to school, and I'd buy them nice clothes to wear to school. And Debbie would dress up to go to school, and then she'd get to school and she'd change her clothes. She'd put these jeans on. And. Uh, Tootsie was a flight girl, you know, she was in the band. And uh, Debbie, she, she would have nothing to do with that. She tried out for it and she didn't make it. But I think Debbie was more of a hippie than Tootsie was. Did you tell me a story about something that Billy did with a little wagon? Oh, he used to take the wagon. We lived um, on a, uh, Cross Street was a busy street. And there was a grocery store on the same side of the street that we lived on. But he used to take the wagon and a note and get whatever I wanted from the store. And one day they called me up and they said, Billy's here with some money, but he doesn't have a note. And so he had just taken it upon himself. He took my tip money and he went to the store. He was going to buy some candy. <laughs> how old was he? Well, he was only... He must have only been four years old because that's how old he was when we moved here. <laughs> Can you imagine a four-year-old walking to the store by yourself? Well, Debbie got married first to a dork, which we didn't like because he was, but he was one of Billy's friends. And um, she just wanted to get out of the house. She didn't want to, she wanted to be able to live by herself. And, um, he was into snakes. He had a lot of snakes. And then he worked for HP, and he transferred down to around San Diego someplace. And then they weren't getting along, so Hap told him, he says, you put her on the plane and send her home, or I'm going to come and get her. So she came home, and that was the end of that one. Who was next? And then uh, your mother. And she had a big wedding, but what I'm trying to think when Billy Billy was the last one to get married. So when did Debbie marry Randall? Um, she got married on Valentine's Day. At and we had the party at um, one of our at Johnny and Maxine's house, friends of ours, who lived in Sunnyvale. You know, we used to have. Like Christmas, we'd have 50 people on the patio for Christmas Day. And we had a lot of parties here. And I think that's what I like best about my life is the parties. Because I couldn't do anything else, so it was easy, easier for me to do the food and get ready for a party. So it's the grandkids that did it. Thank God for 10 grandkids. Look, Amanda was the only one we had for three years. Then you and, and Randy came along. 
then, I mean, then they got to be so many of them that wasn't fun anymore. Name them all. Mandy, Randy, Michael, Matthew, Michelle, Melissa, Alex, David, Lindsay, Leslie, Leila, and Annabelle. And another one on the way. That's quite a legacy to leave behind. Yep. What do you think was more fun, being a, a, a parent or a grandparent? Well, probably... Well, more fun to be a grandparent because you weren't responsible for the kids, really. I mean, you felt like you were, but we had Mandy come and live with us for a month because she was she was not a, a nice kid, and she was in school. She's a troublemaker. She she was terrible. <laughs> she came home with the police one day, and I would have thought her, who's so scared of everything that she, that would have bothered her, but no, it didn't make any difference. She thought that was okay. Is there anything you'd like to say to the family, to everyone you know? Everybody I know in the family? Um, just a, a, a message to the family. So say we're playing this at your funeral. Oh, you're going to play this at my funeral? Well, maybe bits and pieces. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's your what you message you want to leave to everybody? I love everybody. I just wish, I wish Grandpa were here. You know, he used to tie me, every day he'd tie my shoes for years because I couldn't tie my left shoe. So he'd have to get up to tie my shoe before I went any place. Just your left one? Just my left one. <laughs> Can you look at the camera and just, you know, say, like, you know, I've had a wonderful life. I've loved everyone. He wants you to say you had a wonderful life. How many times do I have to say that? Well, you haven't said it in, in those words, really. I think I have. I've had a wonderful life. Up until three years ago. Well, stop saying that. <laughs> just say it. It's been a wonderful We're trying life. to get, picture everyone's crying in your funeral. They're not going to cry. Everyone's going to be man. bawling. Everyone's going to be crying. <laughs> Say something to make everyone end. feel really nice and happy. Say something like, I've had a wonderful life. I love all of you. Thank you all for all that you give me. Something like that. You know, make them feel good. Well, you said it all, Matthew. Well, they don't want me to say it. <laughs> no, I have had a good life. I can't. I can't if I could only open up my hand. Okay. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Well, you keep bringing up the negative. Let's just talk about the positives for now. And we, we can talk about I did say I had a good life. How many times do I have to say it? Well, you, ha you haven't really said it. I have. I've said it three times. Well, let's do it one more time. I don't like to say it. <laughs> That's why I just like to say it. <laughs> I don't like to have people tell me what to say. I'm sorry, but this is what everyone wants to hear. I love you all. <laughs>